good evening everybody on behalf of the silon college of physicians you all are welcome to the inaugural sessions of the peer learning periphery to the four a new innovation from the silon college of physicians my name is dr rohit amaravitarana the moderator of this event for this inaugural session we have two young specialists in internal medicine who are joining with us virtually from Valdivai and Point Pedro. This is one hour session, and at the end of both presentation, we will discuss questions received from the virtual participants. First of all, I would like to invite Professor Arusha Disanayake, the president of Ceylon College of Physicians, to talk few words about the new innovation, peer learning, periphery to the four. Professor Arusha. Right. Uh, <clears throat> a very good evening to all of you. It's such a pleasure to have you joining us today. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Rohit Amaravitana, uh, Council Member of the Ceylon College of Physicians, for taking the initiative to organize this uh, program and inviting the speakers as well. <clears throat> uh, just a brief word of what we're trying to do here. Uh, no. One of our objectives is to improve the analytical thinking among the doctors, uh, trying to solve complex problems, trying to find satisfactory solutions to complex problems. And in that journey, <clears throat> we thought we can learn from so many people. So we have a three-pronged attack on, on learning from peers. We have three programs. One is called the Cutting Edge Series, where we will get an international expert. Last month, we had uh, a cardiology expert speaking to us from overseas. Then we have the pearls of wisdom where we are actually going to get, tap into the, the, the minds of some of the brilliant senior colleagues of ours who've been trailblazers in medicine. Uh, and then they will tell us the experiences. And the first of that, those, that series is going to come up on the 6th of March, uh, which will be Professor Saman Gunatilaka will, will share his ideas. And the third, so that's cutting edge and pearls of wisdom. And this is the third one. This is called peripheries to the four. Now, traditionally, we've been actually, the center has been going to the peripheries and teaching uh, doctors who work in less resource settings uh, from the center. But then we are trying to do it the reverse way this year, at least, you know, partially, we will certainly be going to the peripheries as well. But here <clears throat> we are tapping into the expertise of peripheral hospital doctors to learn for ourselves. Now we must remember that they work in less resource settings and because of that, they develop brilliant clinical acumen. Uh, now the kind of shortcuts that I may take as somebody working in a teaching hospital uh, they will not be taken because some of those things will not be available to them. So they will go through the clinical history examination, bedside clinical examination skills, analytical thinking, everything to solve complex problems. So I think all of us have a huge amount to learn from these brilliant young physicians who are soon after their training, who are manning the peri not the peripheral hospital, that's a wrong word, but outstation hospitals, base hospitals, etc. We have a, have a lot to learn from them. And this is the forum. And I'm very grateful Dr. Jagat and Dr. Ranjani have joined us to share their expertise from Point Pedro in the very north, as well as from Valdivaya, an ancient capital of, you know, like uh, there's a lot of history in Valdivaya. So these two doctors, the brilliant colleagues of ours, will share two interesting cases with us. So now that I've set out the objective and our future plan and our three pronged learning from peers, the cutting edge and the pearls of wisdom and the peripheries to the fore. It's my great pleasure to hand over to Rohita to invite the speakers and continue with the program. Thank you very much again for joining. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, the first speaker today is Dr. Jagat Pushpa Kumara, MBBS, MD, MRCP UK, MRCP London, and postgraduate diploma in respiratory medicine. He is specialist in internal medicine, working at base hospital Valdivaya. He has special skills on thoracic ultrasonography, plural procedures, and chest 
train insertion. He is going to present and discuss medical case of a patient with progressive breathlessness. Over to you, Dr. Jagat. Um, good evening to everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Rohit, for that kind words of introduction. And as well as um, thank you, Aro sir. He was my teacher at some point when I was a house officer, and it's really great pleasure to um, join and initiate this uh, new uh, portal of learning, of course, uh, sharing the experience. Um, before that, let me share my screen. Right. So um, this is a patient with progressive breathlessness who, of course, presented to my ward a um, few weeks ago. Um, the history is a 54-year-old, previously healthy man, um, admitted with gradual onset shortness of breath for two weeks duration. Um, but he denied any chest pains, any fever, no respiratory symptoms such as cough or hemoptysis. There wasn't any palpitation, no exertional angina. Um, he denied any appetite loss or weight loss. There wasn't any change of bowel habits. Um, there wasn't any history of body swelling, anything. His past history was um, little of note, and he is an unskilled laborer. Of course, he was a heavy smoker. Um, on the day of admission, the examination revealed that he was very breathless at rest. Sats on air was 98. Um, blood pressure was 130 by 80, and he was a bit tachycardic with a heart rate, heart rate of 90 beats per minute. Um, auscultation of the chest revealed no abnormal sounds and the clear and, and, and clear on both sides. Um, this is an image of the day of admission. You could appreciate, um, of course, this patient and the next of kin has have given the appropriate consent for um, sharing these images and videos in um, um, academic purpose. So if you can see, you might see a little bit of facial swelling. And in this picture, you can also see um, engorged dilated neck veins. The moment I saw this man, um, the only thing came to my mind is whether this man got SVC obstruction, because I have seen such a couple of patients, or such, um, has several such patients when I was doing my respiratory two years appointment in the UK. So, so my mind stuck in there. And then with these three things, facial swelling, dilated neck veins, and elevated jugular veins, pressure, I just thought whether this man got something funny inside. So the problem came with whether it's SVC obstruction or something related to the heart. Um, of course, what urgent test would you do? As um, our officer said, we are not um, we are not having a hi-fi investigation. Of course, luckily we have um, a mandatory instrument in our hospital. So, and if any, as as anybody comes with shortness of breath, you will do the uh, bedside ECG. If you carefully look at this ECG, you might be able to see um, there is. Uh, change of the height of R wave. Uh, in, I mean, that is kind of a beat to beat variation. I have circled uh, some of the beats with short R wave compared to the other ones. So, that probably electrical alternance I was thinking on the other day. And then that creates the um, possibility of or suspicion of uh, whether the patient is having pericardial effusion or something going wrong with the heart. And then we perform the urgent chest x ray at the same time. Um, and you can see there is big heart and there is widening of the upper mediastinum and some fluid in the horizontal fissure the blunted right costophrenic angle and probably a volume loss on the right side that 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 gave me a possibility of whether this is lung cancer or something uh, malignant operating inside the chest so as i mentioned earlier these are the chest x-ray findings so the clinical judgment was with the initial presentation, clinical examination, and investigation, press of for the suspicion of pericardial effusion or complication of that. So, what would you do next? Of course, the diagnostic tool then um, comes with the two echocardiogram. Uh, we don't have proper echocardiogram machines, neither we have cardiologists. So, this happened in the middle of the night of some weekend. So luckily we have the portable ultrasound scan in our ETU. So I got the patient to the ETU and then uh, did the portable, um, the bedside 2D echocardiogram. 
Um, I must um, thank um, Professor Namal Vijay Singh because we had um, ultrasound work, uh, workshop a few weeks ago before this incident, and he taught me how to do the bedside echo. Of course, I was doing echocardiogram when I was senior registrar at Calabola Profilin, but he could brush up my um, hand skills on doing echocardiogram and how to um, assess and perform pericardial synthesis in just case, just in case. So this is, um, you can see a big layer of fluid around the heart. Uh, this is epigastric four chamber view. Uh, this is um, short axis view on the, on, the, um, uh, on the same patient. So there's a tiny little video. I'm just trying to play that. You probably can see that. So still the heart is functioning relatively well despite having um, so much of fluid inside the heart. So that confirmed the diagnosis of um, massive uh, pericardial effusion or possibly early tamponade. You can still see uh, lots of fluid. I mean, I measured this on the other day. It was like 2.3.2 um, centimeters, something in the inferior or, or epigastric view. So that was the bedside echocardiogram. Um, and that confirmed the diagnosis of um, pericardial effusion, possibly early temporary, as I said earlier. But his hemodynamics were still stable until that point. So the treatment, of course, urgent pericardial synthesis. So he was explained about his critical illness and um, possible serious complications. Um, of course, my plan was to send him to the cardiologist to the nearby hospital, but this man refused to be transferred to any other hospitals. And he, of course, um, tried to escape from the hospital thinking that he's all right, he wants to go home after explaining everything. And then, of course, we further stuck with this uh, behavior of the patient. So we had to keep the patient uh, and then explaining everything. So we kept him under close observation in our ETU. Um, meantime, we got down his next of king, who is elder brother. And then we explained to him as well about his condition and the serious complications. Of course, he agreed after um, understanding of everything. He agreed for the procedure, but the patient didn't. Um, what happened in the meanwhile, his symptoms worsened over 48 hours. That was a weekend as well. So the pa uh, facial swelling markedly increased. His shortness of breath markedly increased and he um, uh, further had um, tachycardia. On the other hand, he had new oxygen requirement. If you could see these two images, this is the very first day on arrival is, um, um, image. And this is after 48 hours. You can clearly see his lips and the face are remarkably swollen than the previous image 48 hours before. However, after 48 hours of continuous convincing that this procedure should be done, he agreed for the um, um, removal of pericardial fluid. Of course, my nursing staff and union doctors were trying their best to convince this patient and to get the consent. You know, it was um, it was it was a difficult it was a difficult situation for us to get his consent, of course, with his insight and all. So, but he didn't want to be transferred to any other hospital, and he wanted to do the, he wanted to get the procedure done in the same hospital. Um, so I have never done pericardial synthesis. I must tell you, when I was a senior registrar in Calabovil Profinit, a same kind of patient transferred to our hospital with shortness of breath and low blood pressure. And then I performed the bed, bedside echocardiogram there. This was in 2017, as I can remember. And then we could diagnose the pericardial effusion, massive pericardial effusion. Then I could get down the cardiology, one of the cardiology SR at that point, and he performed the bedside uh, pericardial synthesis then and there. And then patient had dramatic improvement. So I was closely observing how he was doing. And of course, the uh, Prof. Namal Vijay Singh was um, teaching me on the other day how to do this and how to measure the length and all. So that, um, um, experience gave me a confidence so that you can do this one. Um, I can see there was some cardiologists joining the session as well. Um, uh, so this procedure was done around 10.30 p.m. On a, on a day. So this was done under very sterile conditions. So that's a little uh, video uh, again recorded by one of my medical officers. So this is done under very sterile conditions. What I'm doing is I'm approaching um, epigastric approach just below the CFE sternum, aiming towards the left shoulder, and then 45 degrees. What I'm doing is yeah, I'm giving some local anesthetics. 
to keep the patient uh, more comfy, more comfortable. I changed my needle to give the local analysis a bit more deeper than the previous one. Before that, I mean, I measured the length, how how long I how how deep I should go. It was about two point five centimeters. At which point I should get the fluid. Ideally, we should do the real time imaging, but of course, this was a huge pericardial effusion, so I kept the probe away and then performed the uh, procedure because I was very sure that. I will get the fluid. If you closely look at here, you might see the black or uh, blood stain flash. Even with the local anesthetic needle, you, you can get the, get into the pericardial space. So it was blood stain from the beginning. I knew that. So that's the proper needle going in, 45 degrees, aiming towards the uh, left shoulder tip with a negative pressure going in. So you can see a red colored or blood stain fluid coming up. So that, that, that I was in the pericardial space there. So I must go a little bit deeper, a bit more deeper. So you can see the free fluid coming up and then this is the right way putting in. This is simple as any other selling technique that you do for any other vascular access, for example, internal jugular cannulation, which I frequently do. I even you can see there's another patient being ventilated in my ETU at the same day. Yeah, taking the needle off, leaving the guideline in situ. And the next step is to put the catheter. So, oh, dilate the track and put the catheter in. Unfortunately, we don't have typical pericardial synthesis catheters or pigtail catheters. I think even in the general hospitals, they use um, uh, standard central lines for this procedure. Even in 2017 case in Kalubu Villa, that particular registra senior registrar used um, central line for that purpose, for the procedure. So I'm just dilating, dilating the track. So just inserting the catheter in. Just making sure how deep I should go. That's it. Taking the guideway off. You can see the free fluid coming up. So that's the initial sampling. Yeah, that was that video. So we use, as I said earlier, we use standard central line and under sterile conditions. So this is the ideal um, instrument set for the pericardial synthesis technique, where we don't have the, the so-called pigtail catheter, but pretty much the other, other instrument are pretty much the same as uh, that we used. So this is, um, I'm aspirating the fluid with a three-way tap. Somebody's filling up here into an um, empty saline bottle. So initial sampling done for as any other fluid workup. Um, total of 1,030 milliliters removed of blood stain fluid within 20 to 30 minutes. And the patient were, was um, very stable throughout the procedure. 
this is um, I'm performing the bedside echocardiogram stuff the procedure. So it was completed within 20 to 30 minutes, um, and patient felt very comfortable. His shortness of breath vanished remarkably. Um, his out urine output was increased overnight, and his hemodynamics was stable throughout the course of uh, procedure. This is just after the procedure. I've done the echocardiogram. Of course, it's not very clear image. Sorry about that. So there is um, right atrium and right ventricle, and hardly any fluid you can see. Um, I left the catheter in situ just in case if it refilled, um, then we can aspirate the fluid again. So for the clinical workup on the following day, I contacted um, cardiologist uh, at Moragan Hospital, who of course kindly agreed for the urgent echocardiogram on the following day early morning, which again showed um, 10 to 20 millimeter of fluid accumulated overnight, but otherwise um, function ejection fraction was okay, relatively um, normal heart. Um, as chest X-ray showed some mass, then we got done the CT scan on the same day morning, which showed um, large mass uh, in the upper mediastinum. That was a CT report. So what I have underlined here is important um, sentences. There is low density lobulated mass involving anterior, middle, and posterior mediastinum. Um, there is SVC thrombus causing near complete occlusion. My clinical diag suspicion was correct with that CT scan. And of course, uh, um, I, uh, they could see the um, drainage catheter in situ. So with these findings, they've given some differential diagnosis, whether this is bronchial CA with extensive metastasis or lymphoma with atypical changes or malignant teratoma or malignant thymoma. So what they did was they suggested histology. And, and they, of course, this patient was in uh, Monoragal Hospital by then. And then they again had a problem with this patient because he didn't want to go to National Hospital Varicella for the sampling. So they sent the patient back to us for um, conservative management. Um, but anyhow, we could uh, alleviate his symptoms, his symptoms by um, doing uh, that procedure, make him at least better for the next um, few weeks or so. so. The limitation of the procedure was, of course, uh, lack of equipment, ethical considerations, and the patient's poor inside delayed the procedure 48 hours. And of course, he denied further workup to be done at Valisara Hospital and uh, issues with anticoagulation. The complications of this case um, would have been or could be as this is malignant pericardial effusion, there's high chance of recurrence and the patient might develop the same symptoms again. Um, poor prognosis and uh, venous thromboembolism, thromboembolism risk because that, that the thrombus which was in the SVC, if it dropped down to the right atrium and right ventricle, that can end up with massive pulmonary embolism. Um, pericardial efficiencies, I mean, normally in the, in, inside the pericardial sac, you might see 15 to 50 milliliters of fluid, which is uh, the normal amount, and that function as a lubricant uh, agent for the visceral and parietal pericardium. Um, pathophysiology, of course, depend on uh, different, different causes. The symptoms mainly um, appears uh, depending on the amount of fluid and the rate of filling. Someone can stay without, with two liters without any symptoms. On the other hand, uh, even 80 milliliters of fluid in the pericardial cavity can cause um, significant uh, symptoms. Etiology-wise, uh, it can be divided into infectious and non-infectious causes. Among the infectious in our country, I think tuberculosis is high in the list. The previous patient I mentioned in, in Kalubovila ended up having a TB pericarditis and TB pericardial effusion, of course. Um, and the non-infectious group, malignant um, causes are uh, top in the list, but there are other causes like rheumatological, vasculitis, metabolic, and other things as well. Uh, the tamponade occurs when the diastolic pressure uh, equalizes uh, with the uh, uh, pressure in, in outside the heart. So that is an indication for urgent, urgent, urgent uh, pericardial synthesis. And uh, there is no benefit or very little benefit of uh, positive pressure ventilation. Vesopressors wouldn't do nothing, would do, would do nothing because uh, the problem is heart cannot expand and pump the blood. Um, examination of such a patient, uh, there's a classical triad, so-called Beck triad, which is hypotension, muffled heart sounds, jugular venous distension. Um, of course, our patient didn't have hypotension, neither muffled heart sounds, but he did have uh, jugular venous distension. Pulses paradoxus is another thing, which is, of course, a misnomer. That is uh, an exaggerated drop of systolic blood pressure during the inspiration, 
more than 10 micrometer. Ewart sign is another sign of vertical effusion, which is dullness uh, uh, when you percuss beneath the angle of the left scapula. Uh, that's because compression of the left lung by the pericardial fluid. So the evaluation and workup, of course, uh, start with any other any other patient comes with shortness of breath. Start with ECG. It highly depends on variable changes. It could be even be normal. It could be uh, showing typical features of pericarditis or cardiac pericardial effusion. Um, chest X-ray is important to see the degree of cardiomegaly and any mass lesions. The investigation of choice for the diagnosis is studio echocardiogram, so you can assess the amount of fluid, assess the RV collapsibility, and any other uh, any other uh, original mole motion, mole motion abnormalities as well. Um, CT MRI, of course, important to detect the causes cause for the empirical vision or um, any cases of loculated collections as well as neoplasms. And pericardial synthesis allows you to um, do the fluid analysis, whereas pericardioscopy is um, allowing you to uh, direct visualization of pericardium. And of course, the, the most important thing with that is today you can take biopsies. The treatment or management highly depends on the underlying cause. You might try with some drugs, which is of course mainly for the pericarditis rather than pericardial effusion. But normally, when somebody gets pericarditis, there is some degree of pericardial effusion. Um, the surgical treatment of pericardial effusion includes different options. Balloon pericardi pericardiostomy is, um, uh, of course, top in the list. I'm not sure whether we perf perform in Sri Lanka. Um, that what you do is you uh, put a balloon into the pericardial sac and make some holes so that the fluid can drain into the um, chest cavity, followed by maybe to the abdominal cavity. Pericardotomy, thoracotomy, sternotomy, and pericardial synthesis, those are the other surgical options. Pericardial sclerosis, um, you have heard about prurodesis. This is something similar to that. You inject some sclerosing agents, but the problem with that is uh, it causes lots of inflammation and severe pain or intense pain, and it, it also end up with um, arrhythmias as well. However, that the success rate are pretty much um, good, it, as high as 91 at 30 days. So that was a team on the other day that who helped me um, to do this procedure. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jagat, for very interesting and challenging case presentation. We will take questions from the audience at the end of the next presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Niranjani Perimpanathan, MBBS, MD, MRCP, UK. She is a specialist in internal medicine and currently working in the base hospital Point Pedro. She is going to present and discuss an unusual case of pre-emerging infections. Over to you, Dr. Niranjani. Oh, very good evening, evening to you all. Uh, and I would like to thank CCP for giving me the opportunity to present in the in their very first session. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I thought to discuss an interesting case we encountered in the early December. So uh, this is a 54 year old lady. Oh, okay, so before that, uh, we are. I'm from Point Petro, the northernmost point in uh, point of Sri Lanka, um, and this is the. Uh, our hospital's catchment area and our hospital is a secondary um, hospital which um, serves as a secondary hospital for five divisional hospital and for us the tertiary hospital is teaching hospital Jaffna which is situated around 30 kilometers from our hospital. So moving on to the uh, history, uh, this patient is a 54 year old female uh, who was previously healthy. She admitted with fever for three days. It's an acute fever with high spiking, uh, high spikes fever. And also it's associated with diarrhea, three to four episodes per day. Also she complaining of complaint, generalized body aches and pains. On further questioning, uh, she didn't uh, tell any headache or vomiting and she denies any urinary symptoms like dysuria, dark urine, and her urine output has been normal according to the patient. She also denies the respiratory symptoms like cough and phlegm. Uh, and unfortunately, she didn't receive any vaccines for COVID-19. 
So um, past medical history and past surgical history were not significant and she didn't have any non-allergies. So we did a quick focused examination uh, with this history. Uh, she on examination, she looked very ill and severely dehydrated. She was febrile to touch with a temperature of 101 Fahrenheit. She was alert and not distinct. She was comfortable. Uh, her pulse rate was 84 beats per minute and blood pressure was 114 by 78. Uh, a quick auscultation revealed dual rhythm and there was no murmur. And lungs on auscultation were clear and the air entries were equal on both sides. Uh, saturation was 98 on rumia and a quick abdomen examination was soft and there, there was no ergonomically and especially there is no right hypochondrial tenderness. So but based on the history and examination, uh, actually this patient came to us in early December where we started to get other febrile illnesses together with the COVID cases. So our working diagnosis was initially whether it's a dengue fever or a COVID-19 disease. So uh, as soon as the patient arrived, we have done the rat at very, uh, very beginning and it turned out to be negative. After that, we have requested the basic investigation with COVID-19 PCR. And in view of her severe dehydration, we have given a bolus of IV normal saline 500 ml, followed by we kept her on IV fluids in view of her um, severe dehydration. And also in addition to that, we were giving oral rehydration solution after each loose dose. And also she was um, given paracetamol with each fever. So we received the investigations uh, in, on day one, which we sent in the morning. So the full blood count was suggestive of a viral picture with a low uh, WBC was 2,700 and there is thrombocytopenia 81,000. UFR was not very significant. Uh, the albumin was one plus and pus cells were there, but there are no active uh, sediments like uh, hematuria. Liver function test was slightly altered and uh, ALT, AST both were raised and AST was more than ALT. Uh, renal function was quite normal, except for a slight increase in blood urea. And uh, CRP was high, 110, and we got the NS1 antigen, which came as negative. Remember, this is the day three of fever. So uh, we continued the management as for dengue fever. We kept her on hourly fluids, 100 cc per hour. Uh, because she was very ill and not taking enough, we were keeping her on IV fluids. And the urine output and vitals were monitored every four hourly as for a dengue uh, uh, non-leaking phase. And we added the IV cefotaxim in view of to cover the secondary bacterial infection and she was kept, uh, she was put on a dengue monitoring chart. With all these, we repeated the all, uh, repeated all investigation on the next day. And we got the report in the night, the COVID-19 PCR, it came as inconclusive. So, uh, so on day two of admission, uh, we are still keeping the patient in the isolation ward. And um, she continued to have fever spikes and loose stools also continuing, but the hydration was better with the IV fl uh, fluids. And uh, the vitals and urine output were maintaining properly. So that we re received the second day investigations at 2 p.m. And the full blood count was more or less the same, except for a small rise in platelet. Liver function has deteriorated further. ALT has uh, risen to 281 and AST has gone to 1200. And unfortunately, we got a serum creatinine of 2.35 milligram per deciliter. And CRP also has risen to 191. At this point, we thought that it's not simple dengue or COVID. We, are, we have to change our differential. So in view of the acute febrile illness with hepatorenal involvement, whether it could be a leptospirosis or typhus. In our area, um, the most common infection at that time was like COVID and second is dengue and third one is like typhus. Lepto is, uh, they, we do get patients with leptospirosis, but not as common as other, other febrile illness. So we did a thorough examination to look for an scar. And finally, we found an scar on the lower back, just above the navel cleft. It was in a very, very hidden uh, place. So uh, this is not that patient's scar. Uh, I didn't take any photos of that patient. Uh, so it, just to uh, tell you all how an scar will appear. Uh, this looks like a, like a burn injury or a, like a bite one with a scab over and usually found in the flexural aspects. 
in the axilla or groin area, abdomen around the cloth line, in the submemory areas, sometimes over the back as well. Most often the patient won't remember anything, any bites or anything like that. So it's our duty to look for a scar in a patient with a suspected uh, typhus. Okay, so once we found out the ESCA, we changed the management. We started the patient on doxycycline, a 200 milligram stat dose, followed by a 100 milligram DD. So this is happening on the second day. At 4 p.m., patient developed shortness of breath, and we noted there's a reduction in the urine output. She became hemodynamically unstable. Her part, uh, pulse rate was... Uh, has gone to 150 beats per minute, and the blood pressure became like uh, marginal 98 by 70. She was tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 30, and saturation dropped to 80% on room air. And with 5 liter oxygen, she was maintaining around 92. And on examination, there were bilateral five crepitations. So at this point, we shifted the patient to ETU. Actually, we don't have a separate ICU in Point Petro, so ETU functions as ICU as well. We have six beds with a four ventilators. So we took the patient to ETU. We stopped the IV fluids, which she was on earlier, and we gave the IV like 80 milligram, followed by a uh, five milligram per hour infusion in view of her marginal blood pressure. So we didn't want to give the boluses um, uh, because of the uh, potential uh, uh, potentially a uh, patient can collapse sometimes. Then we nebulized with the protropium and uh, we had to give a uh, bicarb in view of possible acidosis. And despite all measures, she remained tachypneic. So we had to put her on a CPAP and she was on CPAP from 8 p.m. to next day, 5 a.m. So investigations we repeated on day three and uh, it shows the liver function test has further deteriorated. ALT has gone to 566 and AST has gone to 2,878. There's a mild uh, improvement in the CRP. And the renal function test, unfortunately, almost doubled on within 24 hours. So we got the serum creatinine was 5.06 on the day three morning. And ECG, because of the tachycardia and the uh, marginal blood pressure, we did the ECG, we showed the sinus tachy, tachycardia, but there were no STT changes to suggest any uh, myocarditis. But the troponin was elevated, 1,632. The reference range is less than 14. In the meantime, we got the repeat PCR because the first one came as inconclusive. We didn't know whether the patient is having any underlying COVID or any in the recovery phase of COVID. So we repeated the PCR, which came as negative. So this is the chest X-ray we did on the third day after patient has desaturated. It's, it is showing the bilateral fluffy shadows, uh, which could be possible typhus pneumonitis with or without pulmonary edema or possible ARDS. So on day three at 2 p.m., there was no clinical improvement. Patient remains tachypneic. Lungs were showing bilateral crepitation. The saturation was same. There was no improvement with CPAP as well. And uh, she remained tachycardic and blood pressure was somehow maintained uh, without any inotropes. But we noted the urine output has dramatically reduced to 135 ml over the last 10 hours. So at that point, we transferred the patient to teaching hospital Jaffna to initiate uh, renal replacement therapy and further intensive care. So this is a case of uh, scrub typhus infection complicated with acute hepatitis, myocarditis, acute kidney injury, and possible ARDS. So this is what happened in teaching hospital Jaffna. The patient was managed in MICU initially. She required a non-invasive ventilation. Uh, they have done an HRCT arranged, uh, HRCT just to exclude a pulmonary hemorrhage, and uh, it didn't show any pulmonary hemorrhage. There was evidence of pneumonitis with pulmonary edema. But still, patient remained oliguric there, so the hemodialysis was initiated. Uh, fortunately, patient tolerated the hemodialysis, even with all these uh, unstable uh, hemodynamic uh, parameters. So patient made a steady recovery, except for the renal. Uh, the hemodialysis was continued on a regular basis almost every other day. And the patient was discharged two weeks after two weeks with improvement in renal function. Even on discharge, the creatinine didn't uh, return to baseline. So the further follow-up was arranged at nephrology unit. Since the patient has uh, started to pass urine, they have uh, stopped the hemodialysis and then uh, were able to discharge home without further sessions. 
Okay, so few words about our disease, the typhus rickettsiosis. Um, it's a zoonotic disease, vector-borne disease. There are two genera of organisms responsible for this uh, illness, rickettsia and orientia. We can differentiate the illnesses into three main classes, typhus group, spotted fever, and scrub typhus. So a uh, typhus group uh, consists of rickettsia provisaki, which causes the epidemic typhus. The vector is human body louse. And there's another organism, rickettsia typhi, which causes the endemic typhus, the murine typhus. And it's the rodents are the reservoirs for this bacteria and they are transmitted by the rat flea. But these two uh, illnesses are very rare in Sri Lanka because it's always associated with the poor hygiene and overcrowding and transmitted by the body love. So it's very rarely seen in Sri Lanka. The second group is spotted fever group. They are transmitted by ticks and there are several uh, species coming under this group. And this, uh, in some part of Sri Lanka, we do get the spotted fever cases. So the third class is scrub typhus. It's caused by a unique organism, Orientia tsutsugamushi. And the vector is the chiga stages of mite, which can be uh, found in any domestic animals, cat, dog, dogs, and uh, cattle as well. And they have identified about 20 types of antigenic strains in these uh, uh, species. So uh, just a few, um, uh, so to, few words about the geographical distribution of rickettsiosis in Sri Lanka. Uh, if you see that everywhere you can, uh, all part of Sri Lanka is affected and it varies with the distribution of vectors and the reservoir animals. So time to time there have been some studies to see the zero prevalence of um, this rickettsia disease. So I got this information from those studies. The central province has pre predominance of spotted fever rickettsiosis and the areas found is Kegol, Mavanella, Navalapitiya, Gampala. And also they have found the patients they have screened had serological evidence for scrub typhus and murine typhus as well, but to a low ex lower extent. The Western province has predominantly scrub typhus also, they have found some serological evidence for spotted fever also present. Uh, the southern province has a mix of rickettsiosis. Uh, the patients have had uh, evidence for scrub typhus, spotted fever, and also murine typhus. Um, but mainly the north ones, northwestern, north central, and northern province, they are uh, main, uh, predominantly, they have the scrub typhus group. Uh, so this is the latest study which was done in 2014. Um, they have studied the zero prevalence of um, scrub typhus in northern Sri Lanka because earlier studies didn't include the northern province in during their study um, uh, serological mapping. So they have done a study in 2014. They have taken about 64 patients who were managed as clinical typhus and they were able to prove that 54 among them were having evidence of scrub typhus, mm -hmm. the antibodies were there. So among the 54 patients, uh, they have done a, uh, a survey of uh, what are the clinical features they had like. So the mean fever, du uh, fever duration is 7.5 days. And uh, importantly, they have found that among these 54 patients, 49 patients had the evidence escarp. And some people have uh, lymphadenopathy and some of them uh, had hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and some other presenting complaints are headache and pneumonitis as well. So moving on to the clinical presentation of the rickettsia diseases, the patient's usual presentation is acute fever, but they can present as PUO as well. We have seen enough cases who comes on the day two with a very acute fever, like very ill looking, very sick, with associated with severe headache and body aches. So they can present as early as second day of fever. Also, we have seen patients who have gone to GPs two to three times and still not recovering. The fever is not settling and coming after 10 days as well. So they can, they, uh, the typhus can present as both ways. And the scar, which is found in the scrub typhus patient mainly among about 25 to 89. And in Northern province, we do see patients, a lot of patients with scar. And spotted fever people, uh, patients can have a macular papillary rash. Again, it's not, uh, not very common. 
Um, the, another striking feature is a CNS involvement. Almost all patients will complain of severe headache, sometimes warrant some brain imaging as well. We have done a, uh, done a CT brain to one patient because he's, she came with a, such a severe headache with photophobia. And also there was an SCA, but still we had to do the CT brain in view of her symptoms, severity of symptoms. So headache is a very common symptom and it's always very severe, sometimes requiring opioids to resolve. And in severe cases, the, some, they can present with delirium, tremors, rigidity, and features of encephalitis as well. Uh, some amount of large, large and small joint pain also common. Liver is usually commonly affected. Usually we can see a mild to moderate rise in the transaminases and uh, we hardly see anybody going into acute liver failure or fulminant hepatic failure or something. In severe disease um, or even in normal disease, some people can have lung and myocardial involvement. There may be a mild rise in the troponin and it, it, sometimes you can see the chest X-ray showing some pneumonitis evidence as well. But renal involvement is very, very rare. And rarely there have been some uh, case reports, the, the typhus fever presenting with acute hearing loss, late onset diarrhea and pancytopenia, probably due to the hemophagocytosis. So the treatment is very simple. The drug of choice is doxycycline. You, we have to give a loading dose of 200 milligrams stat followed by 100 milligram BD for seven days, that's all. If doxycycline is contraindicated, as in the case of uh, pregnancy or small children, we can uh, give the azithromycin. Okay, so this is how uh, uh, typhus fever patients, uh, QHD will appear. Once we start the doxycycline, the fever will definitely settle within 24 to 48 hours. Most of the patients, they, the fever settles within 24 hours and it touches the baseline uh, soon after we started the doxycycline. Uh, so this is the typical appearance. If the fever doesn't subside after 48 hours, we may have to look for another cause uh, for the fever. So finally, the take-home message is uh, any febrile illness with no obvious focus, we have to look for an ESCA, especially where even though the typhus is endemic in some areas of Sri Lanka, but here now everybody is roaming everywhere. So we have to take a travel history and always keep in mind, if you couldn't find a cause for a fever, febrile illness, uh, we have to always look for ESCA because with DOXY, we can completely and uh, like... Uh, the prognosis is very good when you start the treatment and almost every time the patient will recover very quickly. Okay, thank you for patients listening. Thank you, Dr. Ranjini, for a very uh, interesting and informative case presentation. Uh, the next is the question and answer time. And uh, we receive one question from uh, audience. This question go to Dr. Niranjani. Uh, did, did you do any leptospira serology for that case presented by Dr. Niranjani? Yeah. Uh Okay, uh, actually we didn't do. If you are doing a serology, we had to send the sample to MRI and usually we get the reports after one month, usually. But in Jaffna, they have done, they have thought of leptospirosis as well, but they have done the serology for uh, typhus, in fact. They have checked the ELISA and it came positive. So it's confirmed typhus and uh, leptospirosis, I think they haven't received the report. It takes one month minimum to get the results from MRI. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ranjini. And uh, we receive another question. Yeah, that is the uh, yeah, second question. I... Also, go to Dr. Niranjani. Yes. What is the uh, acetromycin dose for typhus? Yes, that's the same dose, 500 milligram daily for five days. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question from Dr. Jagat? Uh, Dr. Jagat, uh, it is a yeah. challenge and uh, a difficulty to do uh, 
some procedures such as uh, pericardial centrosis, which you have done in limited resource setting. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the challenges? Uh, you may discuss a few and also difficulties which you faced during that uh, uh, procedure and how did you overcome those uh, problems? Well, uh, I would say the first um, limitation or uh, limitation would be um, lack of experience because I'm not a cardiologist, you know. Um, I'm just a general physician who haven't done any such procedures before. So that was um, lack of experience, I would say, even though I have seen that I have seen um, all these videos and practices, but I never do myself independently, but that was one thing. Um, and the other thing was uh, the proper toolkit for um, typical pericardial synthesis, which is, um, you know, big tail catheter, as I mentioned earlier, and other relevant stuff. Um, of course, these procedures are normally done by the, you know, cardiologists or interventional cardiologists in other countries as well as in our country as well. Uh, that's the other thing. Um, on the other hand, patient wasn't too cooperative from the beginning because he didn't have any insight of the severity of this illness. So we had to wait for 48 hours to do this procedure. So that was another limitation. Uh, of course, as uh, Dr. Niranjani mentioned, our ETU is very busy. It becomes HDU, it becomes ITU, it becomes ETU, and it becomes normal load as well time time. So when I, when I am there, mostly one or two patients be ventilated. Uh, I normally ventilate patients uh, without transfer into other units, and we rescue save lots of patients by, you know, short term ventilating. Um, so yeah. I think those are the main uh, limitations, uh, if I can, if I can remember. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jagat. And uh, uh, we got another question. That question also go to Dr. Niranjani. Uh, if you did not see the scar, would you have still started on doxycycline for this patient? Yes, definitely. Because uh, typhus is very common here. And since there are like uh, renal and hepatic involvement and patient is rapidly deteriorating, we would have definitely started on, uh, on Doxy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ranjani. And also, uh, how common uh, this uh, uh, typus in uh, your area is uh, Point Pedro and uh, Jaffna Penin Peninsula, especially uh, the, the complicated cases like you described. Yeah, this is very rare actually to get all these complications. Actually, uh, in fact, this is the first case I have seen with this acute renal ligament which uh, necessitates uh, dialysis. Usually the typhus patients present with fever and there's a mild uh, elevation in the liver enzymes and uh, they will all, almost all patients will have some thrombocytopenia. So our first differentials when a patient comes with like an viral fever picture with this kind of blood investigation, either it's dengue or second choice is typhus. So no matter if dengue serology is negative and if the patient is not progressing like a clean, typical dengue pattern, we even start empirically on doxy. And if the fever subsides within four, 24 hours, we take it as like it's an acute uh, typhus fever. And uh, another good thing is most of the patients have evidence of ESCA. Only thing is we have to spend some time and have to search for an ESCA. That's the most difficult part. But fortunately, our nurses and even uh, the attendants are very good in searching for an ESCA. So they will somehow find it out and tell us, oh, they, Madam, this patient have an es having an ESCA here. So, so that uh, it's very common to um, see patients with typhus here in Northern province. So. I think it's like second differential is typhus when a patient comes with a viral picture with a transaminitis and a low platelets. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's so it's very common here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niranjani. And uh, we have this come... is Arosh, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Professor Arosh, sir. All right, thank you very much for uh, to the to both the speakers for the brilliant presentations. I think I learned really a lot. Just I, I just want to highlight two things. One is of course, uh, when I uh, when we trained a couple of years ago, maybe a few years ago, uh, we used to look at books and learn procedures. So I think what one of the things that Jagat highlighted is the free access of YouTube. And if we are ever not sure how to do a particular procedure, that might that is a really good resource which is now available, which which I would not have had at the time that I was a registrar or a senior registrar. 
or even a consultant at the beginning. So that's a new resource that we can make really good use. That's just one point I had to make. And the second thing is, of course, I just want to ask Nitanjali, do you all have uh, peacocks in Jaffna? I mean, uh, the, the reason why I'm asking is, now there is a belief in Gaul where I'm working that peacocks uh, form uh, are the main source of typhus infections uh, in certain areas of Gaul. And I recently heard a patient actually refer to typhus as monara una. <clears throat> which in, from Singhalese it translates as a peacock fever. Now I, of course, had not heard that phrase before. I'm just asking you, like, do you all see this connection with peacocks at all in Jaffna? I'm, I'm not really sure. Do you all get peacocks no, uh, in we large numbers? Have, and we if so, do we don't have them also. No, sir. It's not associated with that. It's mostly from the cattle and domestic pets, like dogs. Okay, and okay. All the main right. Obvious, yeah. Right. Thank you, thank you. I can add one to you, sir. I had one patient in Malabai. He, of course, came with this peak of fever. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rosa. And uh, we have come to the end of the session. And uh, I would like to thank two speakers, Dr. Jagat Pushpakumara and Dr. Niranjani for their excellent presentation. And also, I would like to thank uh, vertical power, our participants for uh, joining with us. Also, I'd like to thank uh, CCP staff, audiovisual team, and sponsors, Gates Pharma, Selcox team, uh, for their support. Uh, the next session of peer learning periphery to the four will be held on 6th April, 2022. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>